everybody who is listening now um, and also welcome to people who watch the recording of this video. Um, I am Hannah Breckbill um, and I have been um, engaged in agriculture for probably 12 years. Um, and yeah, I just have a lot of of visions and ideas about how our system could be better. Um, and I, yeah, I'm excited to share some of those things that we've put into practice um, today. Um, and I would like the, the group that's here this morning, I would like to, um, to get a little bit of your engagement and ideas um, right off the bat. Um, Yes, but before we even do that, I would like to um, acknowledge the land um, that each of us are on, and that is giving us all of, all of us life. Um, I come from um, a place in Northeast Iowa um, that had been um, had been stewarded and, and used by both the Lakota people and the Meskwaki people from the south. Um, uh, but then in, in the mid 1800s, the US government displaced the Ho-Chunk people from Wisconsin to where I live now. Um, so the, those people are the most recent stewards of the land that I live on. Um, and so I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for their continued um, presence on the land now in Wisconsin and also Nebraska. Um, uh, yeah, bringing their, bringing their millennia of knowledge um, and expertise to land stewardship. Um, yeah, and currently in this moment, I'm in South Dakota, I'm in Rapid City, South Dakota. So in the land of the, the bison and the, um, yeah, dry, dry, short grass prairie. It's a bit very different for me to be here. <laughs> um, and so I'm also grateful for the Lakota who, who have been um, managing land in a really unique and different way um, than, than what I'm used to in settler colonial culture. So um, yeah, so here we all are um, and Maybe Ren, you can start the presentation. Um, I just have, my presentation is just a bunch of pictures so you can enjoy them as, as you want. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I guess I want to start by thinking about a local food system and what it brings us, which is basically, um, yeah, our, our food and our, our life. Um, and uh, yeah, so the question that I have for all of you is what values do you want your food system to embody? <laughs> what, what do you want, what do you need in your life? What, what values do you hold for your life that um, yeah, yeah, maybe a food system or, or maybe not um, might, might bring to you? Um, so does anyone have an idea to start off? I could also start off with a few ideas. Feel free to unmute and, um, or put in the chat some values that you hold um, for, your, for your life, for your quality of life that a food, food system might or might not be able to, to help you reach. The first thing that I think of is delicious food. Um, but I also think of things like um, a safe place to live, um, fresh air to breathe, um, beauty to look at, yeah. And I also think of kind of more social cultural values like 
um, neighborliness, connections to people, um, meaningful work, and kind of the ethic of leaving the world better than we found it. <laughs> um, yeah, and fairness and justice, a sense of community I see in the chat. Um, also comfort. Uh, power in your world, ability to, to make things happen. Um, resilience <clears throat> and stability. So those are, yes, clean water and clean watersheds, I see. Yeah, so a lot of beautiful things that we can aim for. Um, that, that we need in our lives um, and which, um, which are not always met <laughs> in, our, in our lives or in our rural communities. Um, so um, yeah, so I guess one, the next question that I have is in what ways does our current agriculture and food system not meet our values. Um, yeah, so I'll give you a couple minutes to think on that and feel free to put things in the chat or to, um, or to unmute and, and say them aloud. Yeah, so in the chat I'm seeing um, high quality food is not accessible to everyone. Um, and there's not a connection to our food or sense of community or our culture. Um, mm -hmm. Lack of connection. Um, accessibility of both food and land land availability and accessibility. And then, yeah, it's unsustainable. It's not resilient um, and it exploits our land. Um, so values of like leaving the, the world better than we found it or giving the next people a, a good shot um, is really not necessarily met in a lot of, in a lot of our um, agriculture. Um, Packaged and industrialized. Industrialized, for sure. Pit. Yep. Pit. Yeah, and one thing that I think about a lot is that, um, right, so it, it impedes our, our like physical needs for fresh air to breathe and um, clean water to drink and good food to eat. But it also um, damages our cultural needs and our, our human connective needs. So ne yeah, that needs for, um, for connections to our neighbors and for kind of um, meaningful work um, are also eroded by the system that is about um, uh, that's about efficiency and, and like use of land, extraction from land and all of these um, like, uh, yeah, I think about mechanization and the way that tractors can get a lot more done per unit of human labor. Um, but once you, um, once you do that, once you um, commit to kind of investing your capital in a tractor rather than in human labor, um, you end up eroding rural communities because people don't have things to do <laughs> anymore. Um, so there's a, there's a balance there, right? Because you want people's bodies to be 
to have comfort and ease. You don't want to work people too hard, but at the same time, you want them to have meaningful work. Ren, you can go to the next slide. Um, that first slide was, um, uh, yeah, was Emily Tilling. And on our farm, we have started a no-till system. So this is me building a no-till bed, which is definitely a lot more work um, <laughs> in the, to, to start up. Um, uh, and and it, it feels a little bit like counter, counterintuitive to a farm that's trying to make money and, and uh, uh, do good work. But it turns out that um, our vegetables are so much better under a no-till system. Um, and so it is more work and it is more human labor um, to, to get a, 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 to manage a farm in this way. Um, but the quality of the result, um, both for the soil and for the, the vegetables that we produce is so much better. Um, so that, yeah, that's an interesting kind of thing for me. Um, yeah, so, so I guess my big question as, as I talk today is like we're working to build a food system, a food landscape that aligns with our values. Um, and so we have to understand what we really want. And then we have to understand what, what kind of ways of, of being and ways of doing will get us there. Um, which is honestly more of a cultural thing than a technical thing. <laughs> um, so I have a lot of technical things to share, like business structures and, um, and things like that. And I'm excited to share them, but um, yeah, I, I just wanna name that the, the practice of, of kind of visioning and seeing your values and, and moving that forward is definitely uh, a cultural thing. Um, more than anything else. And, and there are techniques that can help us um, kind of shift culturally. Um, yeah. Uh, Ren, you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so these are, these are some pigs. We raise feeder pigs on pasture on our farm. Um, so just wanted to show you some cute pigs, but um, I want to start today with the story of um, how the land that my farm is now on um, was able to be taken out of industrial ag um, and put into the diverse perennial community driven system that we have there now. So um, the story starts about um, in, in 2014, um, so seven years ago, um, a group of, um, yeah, a group of uh, neighbors found out that this piece of land, which is 22 acres, was going up for auction. The, the um, people, the owners of it were retiring, moving to town, and were gonna sell land um, at auction. But the neighbors were concerned because when land goes to auction, the highest bidder gets it. And the people who are able to bid highest are people who already have a lot of capital and, um, and are already um, often farming um, and uh, in, in industrial ways. <laughs> um, hey, the kitty in. Hey, kitty cat. And um, the... Um, yeah, the thing that I think about there is, um, yeah, so, so the thing that the neighbors were worried about was that um, the, um, uh, sorry, it's, it's early in the morning, you guys, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the neighbors were worried that a confinement operation, a hog confinement operation, operator would buy this land and would either use it to build a hog confinement or to spread manure, CAFO manure um, on the land and basically ruin the quality of life in the neighborhood, ruin the air quality. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so that concern brought these neighbors together 
um, and a group of about 20 people were able to buy the land together before it went to auction. So they just agreed on a price with the owner and they formed an LLC, a business structure, to um, each, each member, each one of these neighbors kind of had a share um, or multiple shares in the LLC. And then they pooled their money via this business structure and they bought the land from the owner. So that was um, a really cool coming together um, to rescue this land. Um, but then after that, they didn't necessarily have a plan for what to do with the land. They just knew that they didn't want it to go to auction and, and risk whatever might happen there. So um, yeah, once they were in control of this land, they decided they didn't want to see it tilled anymore because the most of it is really pretty slopey um, and, and yeah, had a lot of potential to erode. Um, and so they put it into hay. They, they um, rented it to people who would make hay on it. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, and then from there, it was a, a practice of um, me. <laughs> well, uh, I was a young farmer at the time, beginning farmer um, on rented land. And I was lucky enough to get in on the LLC and to actually put my savings into um, a share of the LLC. Um, and so then I was part of that decision-making body. And so I got to, over the course of three years, um, convince them that this piece of land could be a diversified farm. Um, and uh, so that was, um, yeah, it was a process, but um, what ended up happening was that um, in order for that land to be a diversified farm, it needed infrastructure and there was nothing on it. Um, so it needed a well or some kind of access to water and it needed electricity and, um, you know, a vegetable farm needs a greenhouse and a deer fence. We're in the middle of a bunch of state land woods. So, um, so I was hopeful <laughs> that the LLC would be interested in investing in those things and then would rent the land to a beginning farmer. But turns out that that's a lot of capital for people to risk. Um, and so what ended up happening was that um, they, they kind of invited me or expected me to to start buying out the LLC and to own some pieces of those land per that, that land personally, so that I could infrastructure on. Um, so that's what ended up happening. I started buying one share at a time, buying different people out of this LLC. And then um, once I had amassed eight shares, I was able to kind of parcel off eight acres of of that land and put it into my name. Um, and so then the LLC owned the rest of the land, but I owned this eight acres where I could start putting in infrastructure. Um, so um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the, the basic story. So that was in 2017, finally, when, I, um, when the land transferred to my name. And so I became a landowner at that point. Um, uh, yeah, and then and then that season, growing season of 2017, was when um, uh, we put we put all that infrastructure in and we started farming there. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, I want to yeah. So this is this is our vegetable field, and and we put that deer fence in our first year. Um, it's two acres of vegetables. Um, which, which is most of the income of our farm. Um, yeah, so I wanna talk about kind of the replicability of this thing that happened because it felt pretty magical at the time. It was, there was a lot of luck to it um, of this group of people being able to mobilize this quickly um, to protect the land. And then this beginning farmer being able to convince that group 
to <laughs> put put land in in my hands. Um, uh, but I think it is pretty replicable because it's a, a very simple technique, the, the LLC, the business structure. Um, and so all it takes is um, a group of people big enough um, who each have some amount of capital that they're willing to invest, they're willing to risk on, um, on creating a land access opportunity for a beginning farmer. Um, so yeah, I think about the word, the words patient capital. Um, these people are investing uh, a chunk of money, $5,500 in, in my case was, was the chunk of money that a share was worth. Um, people are putting that in and then at the, when, whenever the farmer is ready to buy, um, they get that money back. The farmer buys the, um, the share from them. Um, so they, they just, yeah, that, that capital just sits, sits there and doesn't, the, the way that our LLC work is that it doesn't accrue in value. So people aren't earning interest on their investment. They're just, um, their investment pays a non-financial return of, of making this awesome thing happen, <laughs> uh, making a new farm happen. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that, yeah, that, that's what I have been imagining for a couple of years is like, what if a bunch of groups of, of people just um, all over, you know, the country or all over Iowa or wherever, um, were just put themselves together and invested in land, bought land that made sense for diversified farms and then helped farmers get on that land and slowly buy the land from them. Um, so that, that's a, it's a really fun idea for me to imagine because it, it feels, it, it made for me, it made the process of buying land something that felt possible um, when borrowing money from a bank um, didn't feel possible um, just because the, the price of land and the amount of money that I can make from selling lettuce just feel so disparate. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that, that's that story. Um, yeah, yeah, and I just wanna say again, like all of these technical pieces, um, they're just techniques and we can use them or not, but the, the key is to, is like that, the cultural idea of like how, how, yeah, and I haven't figured it out yet necessarily, but how, how, do, how do we motivate people um, to care about the land in this way and, and to care about um, uh, using their, their money, their hard-earned money to make a change on the landscape um, together. Um, it's a very different way of conceiving of land ownership and, and land, um, land as a whole. Um, so yeah. Um, that's that story. And, and I'm open to any questions about, about that story, either, either now or also later, you can um, message me uh, in Whova or uh, by email. Um, but if there aren't any questions right now, I'll move on and we can change slides. I'll move on to kind of my our internal business structure and the story of, of Humble Hands Harvest. So my farm, Humble Hands Harvest, I started in 2013 on rented land. Um, and I went through two different, um, two different spots. So I was in one place for two years and then I was in another place for another two seasons. Um, and, um, I, I, the thing that I think about, and when I'm thinking about my 
my beginning as a farmer is how naive I was, how, how like bright eyed and um, just, I, I want to be a farmer was, was basically my, <laughs> my refrain. And so I, um, uh, I just went for it um, because I believed it was possible. Um, and it, it feels to me like there's so many barriers in the way to people starting farms that it's really easy to, um, to believe that it's not possible. And so somehow I was lucky in my personality or in my blind spots <laughs> to believe that it was possible. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so I started farming and I started um, raising vegetables primarily. And I also started sheep my, my first year um, on rented land. And it's the, one of the first things that I realized my first year was that, oh, if I want to truly create a sustainable system or a resilient system, I want perennials as part of it. I want trees um, and I want to be able to manage land for the long term. And the rental situations that I had were not that. Um, and so I realized really early on that it was going to be really important for me to access land that was more permanent or more long-term um, than the year-to-year -year rental situations that I had. Um, and um, yeah, and then finally my fourth season of farming, I was actually starting to burn out. I was, I was on this rented land and it was hard and I wasn't able to invest in the soil the way I wanted to because it just didn't make sense because I didn't know how long I was going to be there. Um, and so the vegetables weren't that great and it was really weedy and I was just like overwhelmed. And I told myself and some friends, I said, I don't think I can farm next year unless I have permanent land to farm on and I have someone equally invested to farm with me. Um, yeah, I had had employees um, and you know, it's great to work with people, um, but I needed someone who was, um, who was also invested and also was willing to like put in the extra hours um, to, um, yeah, to, to, to have it kind of feel like their business rather than just working for Hannah. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that, that was what I was needing. And I didn't necessarily know how I was going to find that. I knew that I needed permanent land and I knew that the, the LLC um, was there and I would probably be able to figure it out with them. Um, so that was, that was good. Um, and then I just needed the person. Luckily, you can go to the next slide. Um, luckily, um, uh, Emily Fagan, who is my second cousin, happens to be my second cousin, had moved to town um, that year, that my fourth year on rented land um, to work on a different vegetable farm. And so I asked her kind of out of the blue, I didn't know her very well. She's, she's you know, my second cousin. I had met her a couple of times. Um, I asked her um, if she wanted to farm with me. Um, and, uh, and after a, a couple of weeks of deliberating and having conversations about it, we decided, yeah, um, Emily, Emily was willing to farm with me. So um, what we did for our first year, you know, this, this land was brand new in 2017. I had just bought this land and we were putting in all kinds of infrastructure and the land and the infrastructure were pretty much all from my, um, my bank account and my capital. Um, and so what we decided was that we would create a, a business structure, a Humble Hands Harvest LLC. And we would each, we would put in, a, make a bank account and we would each put in um, $1,000 to this bank account to start our season. Um, and so that's what we did. We, um, we just went 50-50 on this, on the money part of the farm. 
And then of the capital part of the farm of the, the land and infrastructure um, was owned by me. And so the farm business was going to rent those things from me. Um, that's how we decided it would work our first year. Um, and, and that meant that it would be easy to kind of, if it, if we decided after our first year that we wanted to part ways, we could just split up the bank account. It would work totally fine. Um, and yeah, and so we worked together for that first year, but um, things weren't um, totally perfect yet because um, uh, Emily, having been being relatively new to Decora and me having lived there for a while, um, when people saw her working um, at farmer's market or whatever, they almost universally people assumed, oh, Emily is Hannah's helper or Hannah's employee, um, which wasn't the case. We were equally splitting this farm. Um, and uh, so that that's kind of can get grating on, on someone who, you know, has, has this ownership and isn't seen as um, in that way. Um, and so we, we needed a way to figure that out. Um, to, to make our community aware that, um, that Emily was just as much of an owner of this, uh, of this business and had as, just as much agency as I did. Um, so that is what landed us on a worker-owned cooperative structure. Um, Ren, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, a worker-owned co-op is, um, uh, so a cooperative is, is a group, an association of people who um, are in, in business together for the benefit of members of the people who own the business. Um, so a lot of us are familiar with consumer co-ops, which like a, a food co-op would be a consumer co-op. Um, and so it's a bunch of people who are buying the food who are cooperating in, um, in the business and, and, and making decisions together in terms of what, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, in terms of what food to source or how it should be priced or that kind of thing. And so they make decisions that sometimes are based on traditional like uh, financial metrics and sometimes are based on their, um, their particular desires um, or their particular values around, around what they want to buy. So that's a consumer co-op, but we are a worker co-op, which means that our, our values um, are driven by our, our work, our, our quality of life as a worker um, in this business. Um, so, Everyone who owns um, part of the business in a worker-owned co-op is, is going to be, ha have to be a worker. So that's a requirement. Um, and which is pretty different than conventional business um, uh -huh, because a, a lot of times there are owners of, of businesses or of the land who don't work in the business or in the land, on the land. So um, yeah, that's pretty different, but also, um, yeah, also like the workers make decisions about how, um, uh, yeah, the workers get all the profit and we make all the decisions um, and, and yeah, make those choices. So um, yeah, it, that, um, so what we did in, in Iowa, um, this is technical details, but in Iowa, you need five people to actually incorporate as a, as a co-op. And we're only two people, two worker owners right now um, with one employee. Um, next year, we'll have two employees. Um, but um, uh, so what we do is we're still an LLC, um, but we have have kind of an operating agreement of our LLC that um, structures us the way a worker-owned co-op would be structured. 
Um, so I'm happy to share those bylaws with anyone who's interested or, or that operating agreement with anyone who's interested. Um, uh, yeah, it, it feels it feels really good to us to have this structure that really um, encapsulates our values in in a, yeah in a business structure. Um, so yes, that is that's that story. <laughs> so uh, yeah, are there questions before I move on to some visioning? I, I see um, a direct message in the chat of where, uh, where did my initial dream or passion to be a farmer come from? And what early training did I have? Um, so yeah, so I, um, I started farming out of a desire to do something real. I had gone to college, I had been a math major and I had been in my head a lot, um, a lot of the way through college. And my last, my final year of, of college, I was like, I, I just really want to do something that affect that like impacts people's lives in a good way. And um, yeah, I wanted to be an activist, honestly. And the best ways I could see an activist or at most tangible was to, was to work, work the, the earth. Um, and so that was what got me interested in being a farmer. And then I had a farm internship um, right out of college. And then I worked on a vegetable farm for another two seasons after that um, to kind of, yeah, understand what, what farming was all about and how to, um, uh, how to do it. And I also took a farm beginnings class from the Land Stewardship Project um, in Minnesota. So those, those were my kind of formative trainings. Um, and then I jumped right, right from farm worker to farm business owner um, in, one, in one season. And I went all in on that farm business and, and didn't, have a, didn't have a side job for that season. I just, I just grew vegetables and, and tried to make it work. Um, so yeah, uh, super. Uh, I was able to take a lot of risks because of my privilege as a as a white person with um, with a family that you know isn't wealthy wealthy but has a cushion, um, and so I was I, I never worried that I would be um, out in the cold. Um, I I. I was able to take those risks. And so that's another thing that I think about a lot is um, uh, how can how can we make the risks less, um, less intense for people because, or, or how can we make the risks more, um, more accessible <laughs> to people, the risks of, of starting a business and that kind of thing. Um, uh, I'm I'm really curious about that because um, I want so much more to be happening on our in, in our rural communities. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? If not, we can go to the next slide. Um, the thing that I have been um, thinking about now, now that our business, you know, our land has been accessed and our business, um, uh, um, yeah, and our business structure has been, has been structured and we're really on a good trajectory with that. And we're feeling, we're feeling successful, honestly, is a, it's a really good feeling. <laughs> um, we're, um, we're starting to think a little bit broader than just our farm. And we're starting to collab with, um, other food and farm businesses in our, um, in our neighborhood, in our, in our kind of close by region, um, trying to figure out how we can, um, how banding together and how, how collaboration can expand our capacity um, as, 
um, as food producers um, in, in terms of feeding the community. So this is just a picture of our spicy greens um, mix, which um, is uh, used really, um, restaurants really like it and, and caterers really like it because it's so tasty. Um, <laughs> but um, the, uh, yeah, so I just have some, my thoughts about this are much less concrete. Um, they're much more in the vision realm, but we're, I'm, yeah, I'm just imagining what would it take to um, uh, for, yeah, what does it look like for one business to really tie, tie themselves to another one? Um, Hey folks, um, I'm just trying to verify if my computer's frozen or if uh, Hannah's. Can somebody just unmute if you can hear me and let me know you're on? I think we've lost Hannah. Okay, okay, good. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm sure she'll be back on in a second. Apologies, folks. Yeah, thanks for hanging on, folks. I think um, I, I know that Hannah sometimes has spotty internet where she is. Um, so 
I'm sure she'll be back on. If you uh, want to stay on, that'd be great. Um, and if you need to pop out, I understand as well. Hey, Hannah. Yay, I'm back. <laughs> so sorry about my internet. Um, Do you want me to restart the PowerPoint from where we were, Hannah? Um, yeah, I mean, sure. I, or actually, it might be nicer to just have a conversation from here. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I've lost all the chats, so I don't know. Um, if people had been asking questions or anything like that, um, you could ask them again in the chat if you want to. Um, uh, yeah, but the, the two things that I wanna talk about um, uh, of, of the visions that we have in our super local community, um, one is related to land and the other is related to businesses. Kind of like my two stories, the one of the LLC buying the land and the one of us deciding to become a worker-owned co-op. Um, so um, yeah, first of all, with, with land, we have an idea um, and it's not our original idea because um, the, the people who are, um, yeah, the people who have made this idea is, is the Agrarian Trust, which is a nonprofit. Um, but the idea is called a commons, a land commons. And it's a way for, um, for land to be locally held by a community um, and to be used for agriculture. So basically there's a, there's a group of people who act as a board that um, oversee um, a land that's held as a commons. Um, and the, the Agrarian Trust or another kind of larger nonprofit is kind of the parent organization of this, of this local group. Um, but then this group can, um, can own land and can lease it to farmers. So this is a situation in which a farmer wouldn't be um, working under the model of private ownership um, and of trying to um, yeah, trying to kind of hold on to um, capital um, as, as part of their business, um, but instead would be, um, would be renting at, a, at an affordable rate, uh, leasing the land at an affordable rate um, with the goal um, of maintaining it um, and making it better and growing food for their community. Um, and yeah, that totally, as a beginning farmer, that was my vision. I wasn't interested in ownership for ownership's sake. I wanted to grow food for my community. Um, and um, so I think, I think that that land commons idea is a really exciting one because it takes the, the burden of ownership off of the beginning farmer and instead spreads it out over an entire community of people. Um, and then that, that community can be supportive um, in, in various ways. It can, it can be an even easier way to kind of support the, the startup of a, of a new farm um, uh, than, than an LLC model is, which requires kind of a lot of investment. But people could just donate a hundred bucks here or there to um, this commons. And really that, that kind of, um, that kind of community support can, can go a really long way. Um, and yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's our idea. It's called an agrarian commons and it, you can look up that idea, um, on online and find all about it. Um, uh, 
and yeah, so we're we're hoping a, a group of us um, in Decora is hoping to really get something like that started um, where we are. Um, yeah, to answer questions about that. I'm I'm pretty felt pretty vague about telling you about it, but um, <laughs> the and the other thing, the final thing that we're we're really imagining is what would it look like. Um, I, and this is what I was kind of talking about before I got kicked off, but what would it look like to, um, to collaborate deeply? And so we're imagining creating a, a business cooperative um, that, so basically this cooperative would be an entity um, and then its members would be different businesses. So Humble Hands Harvest could be a member of this business cooperative. Um, and what we would do is um, we would um, we would work to make our um, kind of similar um, policies within the businesses. So try to pay people um, who work at the various businesses um, in similar ways um, and maybe be able to hire someone to market for all of the businesses at once or do, um, yeah, do marketing work or do bookkeeping work or that kind of thing. Um, be able to pool our resources to, to really um, help all the businesses. So um, yeah, that's another thing that we're thinking about right now, um, which is fun. Um, and it involves a lot of communication and a lot of like values driven visioning, um, which, is one of my favorite things that works out. Um, yes, so there's a question in the chat of, did I buy all of the land in the LLC? Or if not, is there still land available to purchase? So um, this LLC uh, was owning a total of 22 acres. I bought eight of those acres in 2017. Um, and then in 2018, um, our farm business, um, so Humble Hands Harvest, bought five more of those acres. So five of those acres are in Humble Hands Harvest's name. Um, and then the rest of it is still owned by the LLC, but we've been buying shares. Emily and I have both been buying shares um, when we can for the past few years. Um, and so now we're majority shareholders of that LLC that still owns nine acres. Um, and so, yeah, slowly but surely we're, we're buying, we're buying the LLC and we'll dissolve once we, once we buy all the shares and transfer them probably into Humble Hands Harvest's name. Um, and that's another interesting thing because we're building a house right now. Um, and the house is, is located on Humble Hands Harvest's property. So that means that the house is owned by Humble Hands Harvest, which is a very unusual way to um, own a house. <laughs> um, but I think it's going to be um, really great. It, it kind of, uh, yeah, it's a it's a very different, yeah, a, a queering of of um, home ownership. <laughs> um, yeah. So we just reading in the chat. Um, a similar setup for common ownership of land um, in the Poudre Valley community farms. I think I've heard of them. I haven't looked into them deeply, but thanks for um, lifting that up. Uh, a question from earlier, what type of vegetables do we usually grow? So we are a CSA farm um, and a market farm. So we, we go to farmer's market twice a week and we um, bring CSA boxes to people. Um, so we try to be as diverse as we can and we try to grow basically all the vegetables that will grow well for us in zone 4B. <laughs> um, so, you know, tomatoes, peppers, broccoli, cabbage. Uh, cabbage is our logo. We both really love cabbage. So um, that's, yeah, carrots, beets, um, squash. Um, yeah, and so, okay, so this other question, do you need to hire a lawyer to navigate all of these relationships and was that expensive? 
Um, so yes, lawyers have been harvested. I uh, have been um, hired in, in this process, um, but um, actually not as much as um, they probably should be. Um, and that's mostly because of my frustration <laughs> with uh, the response time of the lawyers that I've worked with. Um, so our, our business operating structure, Humble Hands Harvest business operating structure um, has not, is, is not like lawyer official. Um, it's in plain language and um, we used a template um, that was lawyer official, but we have just made our own um, and, and, you know, it's, it's recorded in, in all the places, but, um, a lawyer officially looked at it. Um, but the Hidden Falls Land LLC, like all of these, um, all of the land transactions that have happened have had to use a lawyer. Um, and they haven't been terribly expensive, um, in comparison, you know, a, a few hundred dollars every time that, a land transfer happens, which, yeah, compared to the price of the land is not much. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's that. Yeah, we only have a few minutes left. So any, any more questions, I, I'm happy to hear them. Or if you have um, kind of visions or things that you're working on, um, either in terms of land access or in terms of business um, creation. Um, yeah, or, or a barrier that you're seeing um, that you wanna talk about. Uh -huh. Piper is asking about queering the land. Um, and then there's another question about if we're looking for partners um, to be a true co-op, a, a five-member co-op or more. Um, so uh, yes, um, we are going to be looking, we are looking for more member owners of our farm. Um, I imagine that up to five people eventually will be able to be member owners of Humble Hands Harvest. Um, and our onboarding process right now is to hire people for at least two, probably three years as employees before they onboard into ownership. So that's the, that's the way to enter into ownership of Humble Hands Harvest is to be an employee for a number of years. So this coming season, we are hiring two, um, two people, um, one of whom we know for sure already and the other of whom um, we have some great ideas on. Um, and we'll be interviewing soon. Um, so um, yeah, so that's that's that answer. And so yeah, up to five members, maybe eventually, maybe in like five years, um, we'll have five members and then um, we'd be able to consider actually incorporating as a co-op. Although our business structure, that's an LLC with internal agreements that make us like a co-op, feels pretty good too. Um, yeah, so just talking about queering the land, I am, I am a queer person. And so that means for me that um, the, um, a lot of the like typical ways of being um, in, in, uh, in rural communities don't quite fit with me. Um, there's a very heteronuclear family um, dynamic <laughs> that happens in rural communities. And so that means that I have to create my own um, my own ways. I don't have a, a model necessarily to follow. Um, and so that that's um, that's what I think about when I th when I think about queering the land, I think about we are, we're surrounded by a model that um, that kind of works, but doesn't quite work for us. Um, so for us, maybe as a, as beginning farmers um, who don't have capital, like this this model of of the way farm is owned and and all of that, it kind of works, but we have no access to it. 
And so we have to create different models. Um, that's what it means to me to, to queer something is, is creating models that actually work for us, creating systems, creating relationships that actually work for us. Um, so that's, that's a little taste of what, what I mean when I mean, when I'm talking about queering things. Um, yeah, and then the final question that I'm seeing here is, um, yeah, how this type of model would look like in, in the context of transitioning a conventional family farm. So yeah, I do have some thoughts on that. I, I think, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just technical details um, that have the, have the kind of shared values in the background, right? So I, I could imagine like taking the conventional far family farm and turning it into an LLC that different people have like different amounts of stake in and then being able to kind of transfer kind of percentages of, of, um, of ownership and of, um, yeah, the way of using it. So yeah, happy to talk more, Natasha, but um, that that's the first thing that I think of. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody. It's, we've had an hour together minus the time that I dropped off for a second, but um, I really appreciate your, your listening and, and hopefully, um, yeah, some of what I said was, was useful in your lives. Thank you, Hannah. It's a great way to start the morning. <laughs> and, and good luck. Truly good luck out there. All right. Take care. Bye, all. Bye, everybody. Bye. Mm -hmm.